Well, welcome, every welcome everybody as we begin the latest uh, webinar by the Kahima Educational Trust. Uh, my name is Rob Lyman, and I'm going to be accompanied tonight by my friend Chanda from uh, in Canada. He's a fabulous scholar, and we're delighted to have him on uh, tonight. It's going to be a very interesting um, examination of what was on the other side of the hill for our troops uh, fighting in India and Burma in 1942 to 45. We're just going to wait as we, as people log in, we've got well over 120 or 30 people who are going to be joining us tonight from all around the world. And we give a very warm welcome to everyone from wherever you are. And, and even if you are watching this, after the live event, you're more than welcome. KT puts on these seminars, webinars online. We've been doing it for a couple of years now, and we do it for your listening pleasure. We want to raise the profile of our little charity and the work we do in Nagaland, but also we want to uh, introduce you to exceptional scholars and speakers and people who are working on uh, subjects of of interest to us historically. Right, that's enough of my introduction. I'm going to hand over now to our Chief Executive, Sylvia May. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to another Kahima Educational Trust webinar. We've had a few months break over the summer, so it's good to be back. And tonight, the subject is the Indian National Army. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Chanda Sundaram, who will tell us the full story about the INA during the period 1944 to 45, when it deployed almost 16,000 men in northeastern India and Burma. Much of the historical writing has often only presented a partial picture, and in the West, the INA is generally quite overlooked altogether. In this talk, Dr. Sundaram will give a balanced picture of the INA's combat record, uniquely placed to do so. Dr. Sundaram is an author and military historian specializing in the Indian Army in the 19th and 20th centuries. He has published three books, the most recent of these, Indianization, the Officer Corps and the Indian Army, were shortlisted for the Templar Medal in 2020. Dr. Sundaram will be speaking on the INA's World War II, 1940 to 45, 46, which is his current book project. As ever, guiding us through this evening is Dr. Robert Lyman, military historian and author of many books, as I'm sure you all know. He has recently co-authored a book with Lord Dannett, published just two weeks ago, entitled Victory to Defeat, the British Army, 1918 to 1940. So that's our advertising over for this evening mm -hmm. and settle back, enjoy this talk, which promises to be completely fascinating. And I'll hand you now over to Rob. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And thanks very much for that lovely plug. Um, I wasn't expecting it. Well, we're going to do something slightly different tonight. Um, Chandra and I are going to um, just talk to each other. I've got a series of questions that I'm going to ask him. But I just want to reiterate the welcome that we give to Chanda. I've known him um, virtually for quite a number of years now through his books, and he was a very great help to me when I was writing A War of Empires. In this contested ground of history, it's very important that we get balanced, calm and unprejudiced views of what went on. Uh, and particularly the INA in India today has a resonance, a political resonance that perhaps doesn't fully attach itself to the reality of INA experience in the war. So we're going to start, um, well, we're going to discuss those questions and many others over the next 45 minutes. We're then going to have a quick break and see whether you've got any questions. So as we're talking, please just put que uh, your questions in the chat. Good to see that it's been populated now. Uh, and then the question and answer box. And uh, when it comes to uh, 45 minute mark, I'll sort of draw draw stumps. It's going to be difficult because once Chanda gets started, it's difficult to stop him. But um, we'll try and um, corral our conversation and make sure that you've got a, a chance to ask some questions. So I'm going to start actually with this first uh, photograph 
Chanda, because it's not of the INA, but it is directly related to it. And it's ha it's generated a little bit of comment on Twitter, which is good. Uh, but what, what can you say about this particular photograph? Well, basically, um, thank you, Rob, for that great introduction. And thank you, Sylvia, too. Uh, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm saying feel like a, a, to say I'm not worthy, but maybe <laughs> I am. I don't know. But anyway, um, I'm I'm self-deprecatory at some points in my in my uh, demeanor. But the thing is, uh, pictures of the INA are few and far between. Uh, and most of them are propaganda pictures. But I wanted to show pi a picture of INA personnel alongside Axis personnel. And even though this is of the Free India Legion, the uh, the the uh, force that was raised under the auspices of the Wehrmacht and uh, by Subhash Bose when he was in in Europe in Germany um, and um, and you know composed of prisoners of war Indian prisoners of war captured in North Africa. I just wanted to show uh, you know the the juxtaposition of of Axis officers and INA um, Jawans together. Uh, and I, I knew this was inaccurate, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad there's some eagle eyes out there that have uh, spotted it and are giving me grief over it. So Well, it, it certainly generated a little bit of heat, but actually I, I, I agree with you. And it's, but it's interesting that we think about uh, the Indian, uh, the Free Legion and the INA in the Second World War, uh, something very similar very nearly happened in, or did happen in the in the First World War. Well, I mean, I mean, the thing is that the the, the um, in the First World War, the uh, the uh, the um, there was an outfit called Gadar, which was a, um, a, a Punjabi, mainly Punjabi expatriate uh, uh, extremist organization, and basically they wanted to suborn the loyalty of Indian Jawans in India itself, and uh, and they might have done so had they gotten in touch with the Turks. See, when the Turks took Kutalamara in in 1916, they captured a whole load of Indian uh, prisoners of war, and if uh, if they had been in touch. If uh, Gadar had been in touch with the Turks, the Turks just uh, let the let these prisoners of war molder, and quite a lot of them died through ill treatment and disease and starvation. But if they had, if they had gone in touch with Gadar, and if there'd been some sort of sort of network there, there might have been an INA in the First World War itself. So we're talking really about. I the, mean, this is, of course, this is a speculation on my part, but you well, know, uh, stranger I, I think, things have been known to happen. <laughs> I think I think that's right. I think what what we'll be talking about in respect of the INA is the extent to which the Japanese actually saw this as a strategic opportunity for them. Well, that, that's great. We know you're writing a new book. Uh, you've got a commission with Harper Collins UK that's absolutely fabulous and. I think one of the challenges that I've had researching the subject over the years is sort of the lack of a balanced insight into uh, what the INA was, how it deployed, its relationship with the Japanese and its operational effectiveness. So we'll talk about all those things as we go through. So, uh, Chanda, why don't you just give us a little bit of background to the origins of what, what we what you and I describe as the first INA? And maybe you can then explain what we mean by the first INA. Well, basically, when um, in the lead up to the the um, um, the war in Malaya, uh, you know, and uh, you know, the lead up to December nineteen forty one, uh, you know, um, a certain um, uh, Sikh revolutionary outfits, uh, certain members had gotten in touch with the Japanese. Um, uh, Imperial General Headquarters, the eighth section, the uh, the intelligence section of this organization, and in fact, they had been liaising with the uh, with the Japanese in the form of Major Fujiwara, who who basically, if you could turn turn on to the other slide, please, Rob. 
Yeah. The next slide. Yeah, if I mean this is Fujiwara and Captain Mohan Singh. The Mohan Singh is the guy yeah, with the striped tie. And basically, um, you know, they're they're um when the Japanese attacked in Malaya, um, you know, uh, they 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 had enjoyed a great success, an overwhelming success. And one of the people, one of the prisoners of war they captured was uh, Captain Mohan Singh of the 1st 14th Punjab Regiment. Now, the thing is, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Sikh extremist organization I, I spoke about earlier uh, was, the, um, uh, was a, a descendant of Gadar. It was called the Independent League of India, and it was headed by a guy named Pritham Singh. Now, Pritham Singh... Had the same idea as Gadar. Why not support the loyalty of Indian troops serving in Malaya? And of course, he got in. Uh, he got in touch with the Japanese, who got in touch. Uh, who got in touch with Fujiwara, um, and and you know they formed a uh, a group called Fujiwara Kikan. Kikan means squad in Japanese. So Fujiwara Kikan and Independent League operatives. Accompany the the um, uh, the Japanese army as it as it uh, invaded Malaya, and of course that um, uh, you know when it invaded Malaya in uh, in um, in uh, December nineteen forty one, I mean by by uh, by about January nineteen forty two. It already had three thousand five hundred Indian prisoners of war. It had already captured uh, about three thousand five hundred Indian prisoners of war. And when when uh, um, Singapore fell on February fifteenth, uh, they netted about sixty seven thousand Indian prisoners of war. And in fact, by that time, uh, Mohan Singh, Freedom Singh, and Fujiwara had decided to form the Indian National Army. Uh, Fujiwara himself later on thought of himself as a, basically a Japanese uh, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, in that uh, in that Lawrence of Arabia liaised with the with the Arabs uh, to to fight against the Ottomans. So Fujiwara liaised with the Indians to fight against the British, a uh, same sort of imperial relationship, and this this goes into uh, uh, Rob's thesis that the whole war was a war of empires in a way, and and also goes to Richard Overy's uh, magnificent book, uh, The Last Imperial War. In fact, uh, Overy's been proved wrong because I think the war in Russia is the last imperial war, yes, the war in yes. Ukraine. But uh, but I think uh, I think Overy does have a point. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, Basically, the, the first INA was formed, um, uh, and Mohan Singh decided to, to form, with the, with the uh, amount of men he had at his disposal, he figured he could form two, two Paka divisions. Uh, but when he went to the Japanese, uh, they, um, they took a very dim view of this. Basically, what had happened was in April of 45, Fujiwara was transferred out and replaced by a guy named Iwakuro. And Iwakuro was not as sympathetic towards the INA as Fujiwara had been. And so Iwakuro took a dim view of, uh, of the INA and limited it to only one division. Uh, and Mohan Singh had to fight tooth and nail to form even that one division. Um, the thing well, is... Uh, I was just yeah. going to... Go ahead. No, I'm just going to suggest that. Well, actually, what we do there is we just we just hold uh, hold for a moment, because what we can see is Fujiwara actually is as a uh, I like that phrase, a Japanese Lawrence of Arabia, almost working autonomously in the Japanese army with a little bit of support from Tokyo, but not much. That support was largely political, um, uh, making the most exactly. Yes. And and Fujiwara, it's important to note that Fujiwara and also there was guy, there was a guy named Shizuki who ran something called Minami Kikan, where he liaised with the Burmese, uh, yeah. and you know the Takin movement, yeah, uh, and then uh, you know 
these guys were given, you know, these the the uh, both Suzuki and Fujiwara were the, at the time majors, which which is not a high rank. So um, so basically, these guys were given carte blanche almost to That's to true. and autonomy to do to really really foment a movement, you know. And it's very interesting to see that the Japanese really didn't know, uh, they had no real strategic conception about how they could use these men, although... Um... Well, they, they they had a conception of how they could use them in a propaganda way. Yes. Uh, and of course, they at that time, they had no conception of including India in the, the Greater East Asia called Prosperity Sphere. I mean, their, the, the, their sphere of influence ended with Burma. And yeah. it was only later that they began to to think of India as as a further bulwark, yeah. um, you know, to defend Burma and especially Assam. They didn't think of the rest of India. Um, well, exactly and, right. And so basically, we're, we're... basically, what happened with um, the first INA was the first INA came apart in December 1942. Because uh, the Japanese under Iwakuro started acting very high-handedly towards the INA and Mohan Singh, who was the head of the INA. And uh, Mohan Singh appealed to a guy named Rajbir Hari Bose, who was uh, the head of the political organization under which the INA operated, the Indian Independence League. Now, Bose was an old Bengali revolutionary who dropped, who'd uh, thrown a bomb again uh, at uh, the Viceroy in 1915, and then escaped to Japan. So, so he was more Japanese than the Japanese, and there was a bit of, bit of uh, suspicion between Mohan Singh and uh, Rajbir Bose. Rajbir Bose uh, sided with the Japanese, and then, uh, and then the Japanese decided to arrest Mohan Singh with Rajbir Bose's um, uh, blessing. And Mohan Singh reacted by dissolving the, the first INA. Uh, the, I, the Japanese chose not to recognize that and cast about for a, a new leader and hit upon the Spanish boats. Well, before we'll, we'll, we'll let, talk let, about let, it later. Let, let, let's, before we get to Bose, we've got a couple of things that we need to cover, John. The right. first is, right. first is that. Uh, the Japanese were taken, of course, by surprise at the number of Indian soldiers and British soldiers, some 70,000 Indians taken in Malaya and Singapore. So we've got a very significant prisoner of war population. Uh, we've got the seeds of um, a, a, an Indian uh, uh, rebellion element rebe uh, within the Indian army uh, being generated by Fujiwara and others. We've got February 1942 with the surrender of Singapore all of a sudden we've got the the opportunity of the Japanese have got the opportunity of creating what we've described as the first INA under Pritam Singh and uh, Moham Singh. So, but what what are the motivations for the Indian Indian prisoners of war uh, for joining the INA? Uh, and and how did that actually work? And and how significant was it? I mean, I, I think one of the things that I've come to was the entire context of the failure of the British Empire in Malaya and Singapore was cataclysmic to uh, many Indian soldiers who, of course, had grown up with the idea of the almost universality of the British Empire. And indeed, that was the same for many British soldiers as well. So here we are. What, what are the motivations for Indian prisoners of war joining or not joining the INA? Well, I mean, I mean, first of all, some were actually genuine nationalists who who had had enough of uh, of seeing the British rule India. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, it's interesting to note that a a member of the uh, a certain Captain Zauruddin Mohammed Zauruddin in May of 1940, uh, he's a member of the uh, the Fourth Battalion of 19th Hyderabad Regiment. He writes a letter, a seditious letter, which is intercepted by his commanding officers, and where he says, "I hope this war lasts for ten years." So then the British will be so weakened and then we can bundle the British out of India and be done with them, you know? Mm. And there were there were certain things bubbling up there. Um, Mohan Singh himself was a 
was a nationalist because he'd he'd come to see that uh, that in in Malaya especially there was a there was a color bar and the plantarocracy the British plantarocracy was quite racist and Moan Singh said wait a minute we're defending these guys yeah and they won't even lift a finger to welcome us or do anything yeah you know what gives here you know um there were there were other people who uh who joined the lead of their spear officers of their uh, vice or commission officers and joined the INA because all their friends were joining the INA okay uh and and there were others who i mean amongst that group amongst that second group there were people who joined the INA because they wanted to escape the harsh prisoner of war conditions in the Japanese prisoner of war camps. I mean, Nisun camp, Idadari camp, all these camps, uh, Silitar, all these camps were were pretty horrendous. And not to mention Changi, where all the all the Brits were kept. Uh, and 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 in fact, uh, there were. You know, uh, like like there were quite a lot of people who 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 uh, joined for preferential treatment. There were others who joined uh, because they they hoped that they'd be sent to the Indo Burmese front where they could defect back to India. You know, and uh, pervading all of these was a sense of disappointment yeah. and disgust at the at the abject British failure. Yeah. to uh to provide a victory yeah. and in this regard i'll just uh i'll just um relate a story of of sir robert brooke popham the commander in chief of of the far eastern uh theater he goes off to uh hong kong in october 1940 and he goes to the fence the separating the Japanese from the British territory, uh, in the new territories. And he looks out and he sees little things scurrying about. And he asks his aide-de-camp what they were, not who they were, what they were. And he's informed that they're Japanese soldiers. And he says, well, if this is the average uh, deportment uh, this, of Japanese soldiers, we should have no trouble at all in trouncing them roundly. Yes, this is uh, quite absolutely. ironic. Yeah. I I laughed out loud when I read this in the Little Heart Center for Military Archives, and you know, lots of my researchers, uh, uh, the other researchers there were looked rather miffed at me, but um, but I said, sorry, I just read something that's priceless. It, it, and it, it is priceless. It, it, it wasn't alone. He he wasn't alone, of course, and there were quite a number. Yeah, of... he wasn't alone. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that's pervading the uh, yeah. the um, the fecklessness yeah. Yeah. of uh, yeah. of the British conception. So what we've got here in in February nineteen forty two, we even even had uh, occasions when Indian soldiers were briefed by their British commanding officers to obey the Japanese, uh, and on the same platform in Singapore. Uh, being introduced to the uh, effectively the choice of staying uh, member prisoners of war or becoming members of the INA because it's oh, important of course. To well I mean about 40, I mean there, were, there was a there was a uh, meeting at Farrer Park uh, Farrer Park Racecourse yeah which doesn't exist anymore on February fifteenth uh, February seventeenth uh, forty two in which about forty five thousand Indian troops were were assembled. And uh, and uh, Fujiwara and uh, and Mohan Singh spoke about the uh, the Indian National Army. The other thing is uh, uh, another reason why the INA joined was there was a modicum of coercion involved um, yeah. because Mohan Singh uh, was was in some senses pretty high handed, uh, and some coercion was involved, regrettably. But uh, but a lot of times what what happened is, you know, uh, a lot of these troops, you know, in the in the uh, British conception of the Indian Army, uh, you know, a lot of these troops were um, 
uh, were denied agency. And here they were exercising that agency that they were denied under the British. So in a sense, uh, quite a few of them actually said, let us make a conscious choice here. And I, my, the view that I've come to, it's very interesting, when I began my studies in the far recent campaign some 35 years ago, it's horrendous to think about it. I, I When I was interviewing uh, British veterans of the campaign, the almost universal response was, these individuals weren't true to their salt. And that particular phrase is, is particularly important because they saw the, the INA as being a disloyal organization. But I think it's really critical that... Well, well the thing is, loyalty breeds, you know, you know, the thing is, the Indian Army has always... The loyalty has always been a, a fraud term with the Indian Army. The Indian Army is only loyal to its regiment, okay, and, and not towards the Sarkar or anything like that. And and when the when Indian Jawans, even during even even in the lead up to the uh, K eighteen fifty seven, when Indian Jawans saw that the British leadership was faltering, they said, "Wait a minute, what's going on here? These guys are supposed to be the uh, the Barasats, uh, you know, and they don't have all the answers." Yeah. Uh, yeah. and they're professing this great superiority. What gives? You know, and and there was a real. I mean, I've I've interviewed uh, Dylan and Segal, the uh, and I couldn't get to Shahnawaz Khan because he he passed away unfortunately, but uh, but I've interviewed them and uh, you know they said that look, the British promised us good leadership and they didn't provide it. Yeah, that, that, so, that's, that's exactly. You know, uh, you know that, uh, you know, our loyalty is always conditional. Well, lo loyalty goes both ways, and I think that that's yeah. certainly from my reading of um, uh, some of the INA um, transcripts from 1946. This this feeling of being let down quite dramatically in 1941-42 by by the British uh -huh. and British Empire. Uh, I need to add that it wasn't unique to the Indians either. I've just been reading some memoirs from men of the 18th Division, and they were as thoroughly annoyed at the failure uh, by. The British to uh, defend Malaya effectively and to and to have their heads in the sand with regard to the Japanese, but that's another story. Let's just move on to this because I think this is a a useful uh, little uh, picture which you Chandra have uh, have picked up, and uh, this is a picture of um, INA soldiers uh, in as uniform they were, as they were uh, through to the end of the war. Why don't you just describe this? Because there's some little well, little resonance here for for us in terms of what the uh, Indian Army, or how they were presented in 1944-45. Well, well, the thing is, the this is the uh, the uh, examples of the INA uniforms. And you'll notice that they they keep on with the khaki, okay? Um, you know, the khaki of 1941-42. And, uh, you know, they, they fight in the jungles of India and Burma with the same khaki on. And uh, and of course, in the in the green jungles of uh, of India and Burma, um, you know, khaki stands out like a sore thumb. Um, you know, the Indian Army, of course, mod uh, thoroughly modified. Daniel Morrison has written a wonderful book called uh, "Phoenix from the Ashes," which describes this whole transformation. Yeah, and. Um, and um, you know, one of the things the, the Indian Army did was uh, would change the color of the uniforms from uh, khaki, dusty khaki, which is suitable for North Africa and the Rajasthani deserts, um, uh, you know, to to jungle green, which is, as as I said, it's useful in the jungle because it it affords a, a protection. But what? of course, the Indian. The Indian, uh, the INA, stuck with uh, the uh, the khaki uniforms, but what, and what, what uh, the Japanese, about... the Japanese didn't even bother to giving them. Uh, well, that's a the question uniform. I'm going to ask you. I, I yeah. think th this is quite um, reflective or resonant of the attitude of the Japanese to the second INA, what you and I would describe as the second INA. Could you just right. 
Did you just describe the, the rise of the second INA? Because I stopped you a little bit earlier when you were going to talk about Subhas Chandra Bose. So let's talk about him and the new um, uh, INA well, that, that, well, that, that well, arose. Well, Subhas Bose uh, was a nationalist leader. He was basically, I call him the enfant terrible of the Indian nationalist movement because he was, he was a, quite a bit of a firebrand. He was born in 1897, so he's younger than both Gandhi and Nehru. And in fact, uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant student. He was Bengali, uh, born in Kathak and is uh, and educated in Calcutta. And uh, he was a brilliant student. He went to England to sit the Indian Civil Service exam, passed that, and then elected not to serve in the ICS um, because uh, he wanted he wanted to go back to India and become involved in nationalist politics. And uh, he rose quite, quite, um, quite high in Indian nationalist politics. He became, became mayor, uh, mayor of Calcutta. And also he began, uh, uh, you know, he, he clashed with Gandhi and Nehru on the tactics of, uh, of the Indian uh, freedom movement. They were all, for non-violent, uh, non-cooperation, and he basically he was for uh, employing violence, and in fact, uh, in the nineteen nineteen twenties and thirties, he traveled to uh, uh, to Europe. Uh, he met Mussolini and qu became quite enamored of uh, of the fascist movements. Uh, he always, uh, you know, after all. Mussolini did make the trains run on time. And in fact, in British India, the trains never did run on time. They still don't to some extent, but we'll talk about that later um, if if it comes up. But uh, Bose um, came back to India and uh, uh, rose to be Congress president in 1938-39. And then... Um, uh, was jailed by the British uh, in 1940, and um, you know he always had a had a um, layman's interest in in military matters, um, a politician's interest in military matters, and then he he escaped um, British custody and traveled to Germany, and began uh, broadcasting there, and he formed the Indian Legion, the Free India Legion there. And then ever since um, 1942, February 1942, he was uh, he was angling to get back. I mean, the Germans um, didn't quite know what to do with him. And they were quite lukewarm to his proposals. And India was a long way off for them. So uh, basically, he, he um, uh, uh, was transported to Japan uh, via submarine. And lay and became, um, uh, you know, became leader of uh, of the uh, uh, Indian Independence League and the Indian National Army. And once in um, uh, in uh, the Far East, he formed the provisional government of Free India of Azad Hind, and um, and which was a political organization. And uh, he became leader of the INA, supreme commander of the INA. And he expanded the INA to include uh, Indian civilians. Um, and if you can bring up the next slide, I think. Oh, this is an INA cat badge. Just, we'll get back to that. This is both uh, inspecting the, uh, we'll get back to, if you could advance one more. Yeah, we're, this is both in the uh, in the uh, the Rani of Jhansi regiment. He formed a women's regiment, and this is the the, the behind him, march beside him, is Captain Lakshmi. Uh, the um, and this is a symbol of uh, the total mobilization of the Indian civilian population in Singapore and Malaya, which both advocated. Um, the uh, Rani of Jhansi regiment, although they received um, military training were mostly used as nurses uh nursing the INA on uh, in the in the front line 
So you'll notice here that Bose is in military uh, military garb, uh, you know, and uh, he always had that um, uh, had a military bearing, and he was quite charismatic. Uh, he he was silver tongued, unlike me, and um, and um, he was he was quite charismatic, and uh, he was quite forceful, and uh, and uh, in some ways arrogant too. This is for, um, um, you know, for people who are into medals and cap badges. This is the INA cap badge. Um, and, uh, you know, this is to uh, the INA, you know, even even went to the extent of having cap badges. Uh, so they were a a bona fide army, although they're. Their training was more political than military. In fact, um, you know, uh, their their uh, um, their training was was very um, um, was more political. They were they were meant to basically convince Indian Army Jawans to get back in uh, to uh, to uh, to join them rather than actually fight uh, militarily in a in a um, concerted way. And well, this well, is the... I'll, I'll just, just leap in there and say, of course, you know, you've mentioned this, but the reality is that the, the second INA, which was really established, re-established by Subhachandra Bose, did a huge amount of recruitment of uh, indigenous or uh, domiciled Indians in Malaya and Singapore. So Exactly, it, Indian civilians, you know. Their whereas training, Mon... The training was poor, that's the point. Yeah, the training was, uh, their their military training was poor. Their political training was quite uh, quite adept, but their military training was poor. Um, you know, the Japanese really didn't have faith in the INA, so that they their 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 training was was very much um, very much rudimentary, and also they didn't have very many very much staff because the the INA always always had a uh um experience a shortage of experienced officers because of course the uh the indian prisoners of war that were captured in in malaya in uh in 1942 had been milked of the best troops yeah so they were basically second second rate troops the best troops were um uh were sent to the middle east you know, to to fight against uh, the Italians and then against Rommel. Yeah. So the Far East was always down on the totem pole in terms of of um, of um, manpower quality. You know, for the Indian Army. Well, that's quite a good segue. Um, I mean, a, a couple of good, really helpful questions. Um, one is, what sort of logistics support in, did the INA in the field? I have well the answer of course I had very limited it was entirely dependent on the Japanese and that's quite a useful uh, segue into uh, an analysis of the INA in battle there's some other really good questions there which we'll come to well in a well the, the thing is the INA in battle um, you know if uh, the Japanese relations with the INA were were quite fraught it took all of uh, you'll notice that um, that undermone saying the INA was limited to only one division with with very very bad equipment um bolus um wanted the ina to have a front line a spearhead role in the um in the japanese offensives into uh, into Imphal and the arakan but of course when he met uh, field marshal kontaruchi in uh, late uh, late 1943, Teruchi said, "Okay, guys, you're just a propaganda outfit. You know, you'll you'll do limited work, but you won't really be fighting." Most to come to this, he thought that uh, he lobbied hard for a frontline role. In fact, uh, it was decided to. Um, um, uh, to employ one INA uh, brigade, the Bose Brigade, in a trial basis in uh, in um, uh, in the in the Arakan 
and at, at Imphal and up to Kaladan. Um, the thing is that, um, that when Bose expanded the INA, he exp expanded the INA to form, three uh, to form three divisions. The first division was formed entirely of Indian prisoners of war. The second division was formed partly of Indian prisoners of war and partly of Indian civilians, most of whom were South Indian Tamils. And the third division was formed almost entirely of the Tamilian population of, of Malaya and Singapore, of which there were about 500,000, uh, all told. Um, now, the thing is that um, in the, the, the actual deployments were not what Bose was expecting. Um, they were support. They were not, not spearhead, uh, uh, you know, uh, not vanguard positions or anything like that. But they were mainly um, um, protecting supply routes. Okay, for instance, um, you know, the, the first battalion of the, of the INA was... Uh, involved in the uh, the march up to Kaladan where they met um, uh, troops of the 81st West African Division and they they actually beat them back and they uh, they participated in the capture of uh, uh, Paletwa and Diletni uh, and from Diletni the, their commander uh, 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 Raturi Yes, Rathuri, thought uh, thought India was a scant nine miles away, so he attacked a place called Modok and captured that, and that was a very, um, very, um, very important thing to capture because um, uh, the INA was running short of supplies, and Modok had a supply dump where they got all important atta and ghee. For their for their provisions, you know, uh, because the the you know the the Indian Army marches on a chapatis, <laughs> so they need they need uh, and and also dal, uh, so they they needed their chapatis and dal, and they they uh, occupied Modoc until September, um, nineteen forty four, where they withdrew. Uh, the other thing is. Um, the intelligence um, uh, sections of the INA, if you, if you see the map, uh, the arrow branching out from uh, Kaladan over to the left uh, is, um, you know, there, there were uh, intelligence and Bahadur uh, groups of the INA, which were conducting uh, raiding parties and uh, reconnaissance work for the Japanese. And quite often, these raiding parties would would cause noise and cause disruption and try to suborn in any Indian army ones that they that they encountered. Uh, of course, the Indian army was a totally totally different beast from what it had been in 1941, 42, and in fact, they were shocked when the Indian army ones fired on them and didn't um, didn't. Uh, um, fall prey to their blandishments. Um, the other thing is the at the end of um, April 1944, uh, the uh, this the first division INA under uh, uh, Mohammed Zaman Kiani was uh, was told to attack the the aerodrome the all weather aerodrome at Palal. And in fact, uh, they did. They um, they were they uh, got together a crack, a uh, a um, group of about three hundred INA uh, Jawans, and they attacked the Palal Aerodrome, and they were beaten back. Um, and the the they'd been told by the Japanese that the British were on their last legs, uh, and the British had miraculously found their legs. And in fact, we're beating the INA back, and uh, Kiani were shocked. And um, and in fact, uh, the um, you know the Japanese later blamed Kiani 
for the failure of their whole operation rather than uh, laying the blame at Mudaguchi where the blame really rested. Um, the INA uh, was um, was subject to uh, lots of air attacks by RAF uh, Hurricane and Vengeance dive bombers. And of course, the Japanese did not have any uh, any air power to speak of. So the INA suffered uh, quite quite harshly. Um, the INA was also subject to uh, disease. Uh, they had very limited supplies of quinine, so malaria was a big problem. All told, the in these two uh, two sectors, the INA deployed around nine thousand nine thousand men, about thousand five hundred in the in the Ar Arakan and Kaladan, and about 7,000 men in, um, in, the, um, in the Imphal front. Um, there were other places like, for instance, uh, Bongli and Chamol, where the INA uh, established outposts, and they would conduct raiding parties. And quite, quite often, these raiding parties were um, uh, you know, because compasses were in short supply, sometimes the INA would get lost and they would, um, you know, they would pre try to press home their attacks despite that. But quite often what happened is what happened is the INA would be in the, on the cusp of, of overrunning a British picket and uh, they would have to withdraw because, of course, um, they ran out of ammunition because ammunition was in short supply. In fact, they were only allowed about 50 hand grenades per unit. And these were, um, uh, these were in the hands of the Japanese liaison officers and distributed quite parsimoniously, uh, to say the least. So um, when the INA l later um, um, uh, regrouped in in uh, in October and November 1944, uh, both who had been kept in the dark about all these uh, developments were shocked by what um, by what um, uh, Kiani and Shanawas Khan told him. Now the other thing is the one last point about these uh, these positions was was that the INA was forced to do coolie labor a lot of times. And this was not what the INA envisaged uh, for itself. And quite frankly, um, both Shahnawaz Khan and Kiani complained bitterly about this. Um, yes, it, it, it's quite a tragic story, the whole of 1944. We'll, we'll just nip on as, as we come to, a, to an end to talk about um, 1945. But it strikes me that the, the entire story of 44 is is uh, the triumph of hubris over reality. And it's not fair to say this was simply something that was a problem with the INA. The whole of the Japanese army under Motoguchi was suffering from the same level of hubris. Well, well, in, in, well, in, well, just a quick point about the um, about tactics, because, of course, the INA were forced to, to, to deploy tactics that um, the Indian Army and the British Army had ceased to use, i.e. unsupported infantry attacks on defended positions. This was something that uh, really um, smacked of 1916 and, uh, and not 1944. And yet um, the Kiani was repeatedly sent into battle uh, by, the, by the Japanese with very, very little support. Now, it's fair to say that the Indian National Army troops had the same support, well, less than the same support as the Japanese, but the Japanese were making the same mistakes. Well, well, and the INA, uh, you know, Kiani was actually told for his attack on Palo uh, Airfield to to leave all his uh, heavy equipment behind because this was going to be a triumph. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, and I'm not sure what uh, what the Japanese were thinking because they they knew that Halal would be would be heavily defended. One of the ideas of Mutaguchi in the first place was to the whole idea behind the the you know the the Operation Hago and Yugo was an Operation Yugo especially in in um, in Infall was to 
was to capture all the airfields because they were causing the um, uh, the uh, uh, the Japanese a lot of grief because the British by that time had a, a, a had air superiority. The other thing is, um, you know, the the Mutaguchi supply lines were were quite thin, yeah. and he expected to cap capture, uh, you know, in in uh, the initial uh, Japanese attack on Malaya in forty two. It captured a bunch of these Churchill rations, which is the Japanese term for for uh, supply dumps captured from the British. Yeah. And of course, there were no Churchill rations to be captured because the Jap the British had had devised tactics like the admin box tactic and air supply to to supply their forces. The Japanese had no air supply, and in fact, the Japanese. At one point, you know, I had to laugh when I first read this way back when in the 1980s was that the Japanese were, um, were, uh, had herds of water buffalo to provide them with meat, you know, and they were driving these along alongside their advance, you know, and, uh, and it's a bit ludicrous actually. Um, but Mutaguchi thought, you know, he was, he was, it was victory disease all over again, you know? I think, and I think the other, the other, the other point, if I can just leap in, is just, just to um, um, reinforce the point you made. One of the reasons why Subhas Chandra Bose was so angry at the misappropriation or the misuse of um, the INA was that Bose's complete conception of operations was that the INA would be the political demonstration for Indians of this uh, joint uh, Japanese Indian offensive into into, into India to uh, bring down the Raj and not not to use the Indian Army as um, as shock troops uh, in 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 um, in vain attacks. Let's we're, we're we're running out of time. I just quickly want to uh, point everyone's attention down here to Mount Popper um, on the eastern side of the Irrawaddy, which was a uh, the last fighting gasp of the INA in 1945. There's a, a a little bit of an indistinct picture of the of Mount Popper there, and the final photograph is of INA soldiers uh, in their 1940 khaki captured uh, at Mount Popper. I just um, just want to ask you as as we as we draw stumps, and we'll then go to questions, uh, Chanda, about the um, you know the failure of the INA uh, to achieve what Bose. Uh, expected of it in 1944 and 45 wasn't really the INA's fault uh, and it's very easy to be very critical of them uh, given the fact that actually the Japanese had at a strategic level weren't weren't convinced of their utility and there's a very very significant difference between what Bose expected what the soldiers of the I INA particularly the first division uh, thought they might be able to achieve being professional soldiers and and what the Japanese high command expected, but can we just um, finish this by saying, well, okay, that's what 1945 saw of the INA. 1946. This is the final point, which I'll hand over to you. 1946 was was very very different because I have a view that the INA could have been relegated to a footnote in history were it not for political mistakes made at the end of the war, particularly in India. Uh, with the Red Fort trials in 1946, what do you think about that? Well, well, the thing is, um, you know that uh, that the INA could have been could have been um, um, as a picture of my papa there. Sorry, I um, forgot to move the slides on. Here we are. Anyway, um, anyway, the thing is, in 1946, they had all these INA captured uh, uh, captured INA members, and uh, both had, of course, died. Uh, fleeing uh, uh, putatively to the Soviet Union, one wonders what he might have done there, what he would have done there. But, but there's some in, in India who think that Bose, Bose had already uh, presaged the Cold War, but I, I seriously doubt that. Um, and but the thing, is, but the thing is, you know, um, uh, the the INA were were captured. And then it was decided to, because during the war, the INA 
the Congress uh, had no truck with the INA, despite the fact that the INA sought to be the second front of the Indian independence movement. Uh, you know, both both Nehru and Gandhi thought of them as misguided, and they would fight tooth and nail against the INA. But uh, when 1946, 45, 46 rolled around, they changed their tune, mainly because uh, of the Quit India movement, because the, uh, the the Congress leadership had been jailed in 1942, in August 1942, and in their three months, three years of um, of uh, imprisonment. Uh, Pakistan had become a reality, and the league, the Muslim League, had grown in leaps and bounds, and Pakistan was a real threat. There were elections coming up to the Indian assemblies, and Congress leadership was was uh, let out, and uh, they needed a a um, an issue, and the INA was just such an issue. Now the British unwittingly fell into the trap because they. Uh, they promoted Indian unity behind the INA by by trying in the first INA trial, Shah Nawaz Khan, a Muslim, uh, Gurbak Singh Dillon, a Sikh, and um, uh, God, P.K. Prem Kumar Segal, a Hindu. Now, the thing is, if you want to unite India, Ninety-eight <laughs> percent of whom are either Muslim, Sikh, or Hindu. You put I Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh on trial, yeah. so there is an uproar. And in the and in the you know in February nineteen forty-five, uh, forty-six, there of course the um, uh, the uh, Indian uh, Royal Indian Navy mutinies. It was 20,000 Indian ratings mutiny. And one of their the key demands is to the um, uh, is for the INA to be yeah. released. Yeah. And in fact, and in fact, uh, uh, the the prime minister at the time, uh, the British prime minister at the time, Attlee, uh, when he was interviewed in 1940s, in 1956, long after this, maybe out of Sour grapes at Gandhi or whatever. I don't know. But he rated the INA as much more of a threat to British stability than uh, than Gandhi and his non Sadhyagraha campaigns. And this leads me to think that, you know, in British accounts, in Hugh Toy's uh, account and in Lawrence James's account, the INA is always pegged at being being only 20,000, only 20,000 strong total, you know? And I think, I think this is a bit of a low ball figure because it, uh, it, um, I think there must have been a lot more, uh, you know, INA uh, members. And this really spooked the British because if they didn't have the army, where were they going to go? Yeah. Because the army was always, as it had been in the in 1857, the army was always the last line of defense. Yeah. OK, we're going to have to draw stumps now. There are anyway, thank you very much. Well, just just hang on, John. We've got a couple of questions which right. we'll, we'll quickly answer. We've talked Don't about worry. logistic support. Um, how were if it, and the real challenge with these presentations is cramming so much fascinating stuff into a short space of time. I could um, talk for two hours, actually. Well, and more. Um, uh, how, if at all, were the INA represented in the Indian Army post-independence? Well, not at all, is the, is the answer. It was very interesting that the Indian Army, um, uh, although um, members of the INA were given a military rank, they weren't actually employed, and most of them were retired off. There might have been one or two that hung around, but they played no military role in the Indian Army after 1946, 47. Well, well, I mean, basically... that just goes to... Basically, um, you know, during during the the war itself, you know, when when of course when the uh, when the Indian Army troops uh, uh, liberated Rangoon, they 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 saw the INA as as doing a sterling job keeping the peace when the Japanese had left and keeping the civil order. Um, but uh, but post independence, the uh, 
the the prevailing mood in the um, in uh, in the Indian Army was the the INA had 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 blotted the glorious copybook of the Indian Army in World War II, and uh, and they were given no um, no um, uh, place at all. In fact, uh, Kaushik Roy in a book, uh, the Oxford Companion to a Warren Society in India or some such thing, um, he neglects. It was published in two thousand nine. He neglects to mention the INA at all, and I took him to task about this. And he says, "Oh yes, publishers, you know, uh, said this, but I suspect that uh, that the Congress Party leaned on him not to include the INA because, of course, you know, if you le lend credence to the INA, it detracts from the the glorious, um, you know, uh, triumph of Gandhi and nonviolence and some such other things." But I, I think the specter of the INA spooked the British to the core. Well, oh, yes. well, absolutely, certainly. I mean, it's very interesting. That this is the final point we'll make before we hand back to Sylvia, because we have run out of time. There are a number of very interesting questions, um, which uh, we'll, we'll reply to by email. But the um, the, the fascinating thing is that uh, um, Gandhi and, and Nehru in particular didn't want the spotlight on the INA for political reasons. But at the same time, weren't prepared to um, give the credit to the defeat of the Japanese well, to the well, the, well, the, well, they were they were politicians. They you were know, politicians. <laughs> politicians use what is what is expedient. That's exactly and they, right. They, and then they jettison the thing. I mean, in fact, in 1984, they were still they only got around to offering. Freedom fighters' pensions to cer certain INA personnel. Yeah, you know, and no, we're going to after, have to. We're going to have to. We're going to have to draw you know, stops there. I'm afraid. Right. We, no problem. We, um, just, just hang. On. I'm now going to. Well, I'm going to thank everyone for listening. There's some great um, questions and and uh, in the chat. Um, a final question. I just need to say before I hand over to Sylvia. There's a question about um, whether. Uh, we're right in accusing Bose as being a fascist. I don't think those sort of fascist or socialist um, labels actually work with Bose. He was a, he was a nationalist. He was very happy to work with those who supported him. He was uh, he, he became a threat to uh, Gandhi. There's no doubt that he became a threat to Gandhi's uh, Congress movement and was thrown out of what was described as the big tent because he wanted to plow his own burrow. He was uh, a nationalist of his own making and. The fact that he uh, went and tried to gain support from Hitler and uh, and Tojo in Tokyo doesn't make him a fascist. It just makes him a you know a single-minded nationalist. And I think we can we can leave it there. Right, it's time now to thank Chanda very much and to hand back to Sylvia um, to wrap this evening up. Well, thank you, Rob, and thank you, Chanda. What a brilliant and hugely interesting talk a very balanced talk on a subject that is um, very little discussed here and I'm sure will will inspire further discussion amongst all the viewers. There have been lots and lots of questions. I fear we may not have got to many of them. Well, but, well um, we you know, will. You, can, you, can, um, you can forward them to me and I'll make sure to answer all of them. Oh, brilliant. brilliant, Chanda. Thank you. And that's um, we will we have them recorded. So we will be. And if you haven't had a chance to ask your question and think of one afterwards, please don't hesitate just to drop me an email. And and, and, and please, uh, Sylvia, please, you know, uh, uh, attendees who want my email, uh, you know, feel free to distribute that, too, because as always, I'm interested in what people have to say and the discussion. Uh, and you know, questions, questions might might um, uh, you know might inspire me to. As I say, I'm still writing the book, so questions might might inspire me to look at new avenues which I haven't considered yet. So it's always a a cross pollination, you know. Brilliant. Well, I'll do that, Chanda. Thank you. And um. And then Rob's got a picture of our new poppy pin, which I'm just going to plug at the end. Um, we specially commissioned this from Royal British Legion and uh, celebrate to celebrate the 80th anniversary next year. And uh, thanks to RBL's generosity, um, all proceeds, if you buy them from our website, will go to our work in Nagaland. 
And um, if you go onto the shop on the website, you'll also find lots of Naga jewellery, bags and shawls available, which will make lovely Christmas gifts around the corner. Um, our friends in Nagaland are currently making some Christmas cards for us. So those will be available also on the shop very soon. Um, next year, as we've mentioned before, the 80th anniversary year, we'll be bringing you a series of webinars on the stories of many different from many different uh, regiments that were involved in the battle and campaign. But next week, we'll kick this off with the Dorsets. Just a week away, as we will um, we will be in the company of Christopher Jarry and Elliot Metcalf from the Keep in Dorset, who will take us through events from the Dorset's perspective. And as always, we've had lots of our wonderful, uh, loyal speakers attend tonight. And um, along with our thanks to Chandra, I'd like to thank all of you. You've all given and do give and will give considerable time, a uh, considerable amount of your time for free, which is enormously appreciated. And I know you watch and support us. So thank you to you all. And thank you to all our viewers. Thanks for joining us and see you next time. Good night. Good night, night Sylvia. Good night, Rob. Good night, Sylvia. And good night, everyone who attended. Thank you.